This is David Bergantino, author of the Freddy Krueger's Tales of Terror series. You're listening to the 80s Slasher Librarian's audiobook presentation of Virtual Terror. Keep it scary out there. Hey, Slashaholics, this is the 80s Slasher Librarian. Be sure to check out and join the Facebook group page, follow the channel on Twitter and Instagram, and also check out the merch store and the Patreon page. Uh, the links to all of these are in the description below. Uh, just let you know, I depend on horror fans like you to keep this channel going and growing for years to come. Cannot monetize the channel due to the content and the copyrights surrounding it. So the Patreon is what keeps the channel funded. You can sign up and support the channel for as low as $2 per month. You get some great rewards depending on the tier you select. You get early access to certain content. A weekly exclusive podcast only on Patreon. You can also voice characters and audiobook narrations. You can get free merch, free ebooks, and so much more. Check out the Patreon page and sign up today for as low as two bucks. Really use your support, and you'll be helping this channel keep going and growing for a long time to come. Freddy Krueger's Tales of Terror, Virtual Terror by David Bergantino Chapter 5 Keith awoke lying on his stomach, his face buried in his pillow, hard plastic pressed against his chest. Gasping for breath, he flipped over, relieving the pressure on his bruised hand. Cold sweat flowed from every pore. He tried at first to relax in an attempt to fall back asleep. But the images of the skeleton, the blood, and worst of all, Mario's cruel face were tattooed onto the backs of his eyelids. Sleep was not an option. His clock radio told him it was 7.57 a.m. The sky was light. The aroma of coffee weakly invaded his room. He could hear his mother's slippered feet padding around in the kitchen. Normally, Keith would have gone on downstairs for a cup of coffee. But he was still unready to explain his injured hand. He headed directly for the shower instead. Keith was, as always, grateful to have a bathroom that adjoined his bedroom. He could avoid being seen and kill time easily. Hopefully, his mother would be gone before he had to go down. Nearly 30 minutes later, Keith stepped from a hot shower. Steam clouded over the bathroom mirror. He opened the door that led into his bedroom to dispel the mist hanging in the air. He pointed the blow dryer at the mirror and switched it on. Soon, a round area on the mirror's surface cleared. Condensation framed Keith's face when he looked at his reflection. A warp in the mirror distorted his image, giving him a very tall Frankenstein-esque forehead. When he tilted to the side, one eye became decidedly larger than the other. Sometimes Keith would experiment with the position of his face in the mirror, finding new ways to sculpt his features but his nightmare had stayed with him like a vicious hangover. And now he just growled at his reflection, quickly ran some gel through his hair, threw on some jams and a t-shirt, and went downstairs. The kitchen was empty. His mother had already left. It was Sunday, so there must be some garden club breakfast or brunch. A half pot of hot coffee sat in the coffee maker. Keith filled a large mug and toasted a bagel to complete his breakfast. By the time Keith finished, it was 9.30 a.m., early but late enough for Carrie to be awake. She would probably be sitting on her back porch painting. This had been her Sunday routine for as long as he had known her. Carrie's heart had been set on going to art school since early childhood. She was a gifted painter, 
the influence of the Impressionist obvious in her work. She had no use for computers nor graphic or commercial art. Museums and tasteful homes would display her work, she claimed, not billboards or juice bottles. Yet, for all her desire to become a pure artist, she lacked the pretension of other artsy types at Springwood. Keith had not called Carrie in months. Just the thought of doing so now gave him butterflies in his stomach. This was not the sick feeling of the night before, but nervousness, plain and simple. He stared at the telephone for several minutes before reaching for it. Holding the receiver in his hand, he stared at it longer until a recorded message asked him to hang up and try his call again. He held the button down until he got a dial tone once more, then punched in Carrie's number slowly. Hi, he said lamely when she answered the phone. It's me, Keith. Hi, Keith, she said cheerily. He had called during her morning painting for a reason. She was usually in a calm, peaceful mood as she painted. He heard no recrimination in her voice. First, he said, barreling forward, I want to apologize for what I said yesterday. I don't know what my problem was. It's okay, she told him. I think we were both kind of nervous. Keith silently agreed. I was hoping we could try again, he said. Then, before she misunderstood him, he added quickly, uh, the four of us getting together on a double date and uh, act normal this time. That'd be great, Carrie said without hesitation. Really? He said, stunned. He'd expected this to be a lot harder than it was turning out to be. Really? She said. He could tell by her voice that she was smiling. In that case, how about if we meet at uh, Wide Awake tonight around 8? It was short notice for everyone, but he was on a roll and didn't want to give anyone, particularly himself, time to change their mind. Sounds great, Carrie told him. But I can't stay out too late, school night and all. No problem, he assured her. This would be casual anyway. It was really happening. He couldn't believe it. I'm looking forward to it, he added. So am I, she replied, utterly sincere. Then she hung up. Keith sat and breathed deeply for a minute after he hung up the phone. He had been worried that just talking to her again would awaken old feelings, that just the sound of her voice on the phone would make him fall in love with her again. But that had not happened. Instead, he felt as if he was re-establishing ties with an old close friend, the way it had been when he and Mario patched things up. Keith did not see Mario as planned that afternoon because his aunt insisted that he make up the homework time he had missed the night before, but he was happy to hear that Keith had called Carrie and said he looked forward to all of them getting together later. When he told Pam about the plan, she said she was very proud of him. He felt like celebrating the moment with her alone, before they saw the others that night. But when he told her he was coming over to take her for a drive, she said she couldn't. If she was going out that night, she had to finish all of her work in the afternoon. Reluctantly, Keith let her off the hook and said he'd pick her up later. Hanging up the phone, he felt let down. It was his own fault for getting so excited, because he had no one to hang out with during the day. Time crawled at the pace of a snail on value. He attacked his homework and finished it quickly. MTV absorbed a few hours, but not enough. Finally, he showered and changed and found himself ready to go an hour earlier than necessary. The house was utterly silent as Keith sat nervously at the edge of his bed, watching time march inexorably by. He stood and began to pace restlessly at one point, stopping before the Virtual Illusions poster, which still rested on the floor. Might as well hang it, he thought. That should kill a few minutes. A blip of apprehension shot through him when he touched the frame, but he ignored the feeling. Just more jitters, he thought. Carefully catching the wire on the back of the frame on the nail, he mounted the poster to his wall. When he stepped back, he judged it to be straight, and on the first try, too, he thought, impressed with himself. Might as well give this another try, Keith said to himself. The memory of his strange experience in the mall reared up in his mind, but Keith dismissed it. The whole thing had probably just been the result of a glorified head rush, so he focused his eyes on his reflection in the glass. 
Several minutes passed before Keith looked away from the poster. The image had not yet materialized. Strange, he thought. It shouldn't be that hard, unless there was no image to see. But why would Virtue Illusion sell a bogus poster? They wouldn't, he answered himself. Besides, he thought that he had caught sight of some kind of image in the poster while he was at the mall. So he tried again, but still no luck. Rubbing his temples to relieve the building tension, he wondered why an image in Mysteria was eluding him. He closed his eyes for a few seconds and relaxed and then started again. The next time he looked at the clock, nearly 45 minutes had passed. He had no idea he'd been staring that long. How did that happen, he wondered. If he didn't leave soon, he'd be late. But conjuring an image had now become an obsession, and Keith resolved not to leave his house until he had seen it. Ignoring a growing headache, he put all of his concentration into discovering Mysteria's hidden picture. This time he had better luck. Keith caught the edge of a shape, but a twinge of pain caused him to lose it. His eyes felt like they were being pulled from their sockets, but he was close. He'd get it this time. One more try. The colorful dots soon diverged again and then began to reform. A shape appeared, and Keith fought off more pain to keep it in his sight. It worked. An image sprang from the poster. Keith gasped. Fresh pain flared behind his eyes, but he held his focus. This image was so unexpected that at first he couldn't tell what it was. Fear replaced shock as the image became easily recognizable. He was looking at a male human face. It seemed vaguely familiar, but he could not understand why. A mask of terror and agony stared out at Keith. The eyes were wide with fear and pain. The mouth opened in a silent scream. An unidentifiable inverted V-shaped object protruded from the subject's mouth. Cat scratches of dread crawled up his back, but Keith could not look away. The image seemed to be drawing him in, infusing him with the terror expressed in the face floating before him. Finally, a vicious bolt of pain much worse than the earlier ones caused Keith to clamp his eyes shut, breaking the connection. He staggered to the bathroom. As he swallowed two Tylenol, he wondered why a virtual image poster would contain an image like that. Usually, they showed planes of dinosaurs or dolphins, innocuous stuff. And how could he recognize the subject of one? The really strange thing was that the three-dimensional images were normally very crude and appeared as objects cut from styrofoam. The face Keith saw was much more detailed than usual. He had been able to discern individual hairs on the subject's head, hairs that were standing straight up. His own head throbbing, Keith leaned against the basin. Closing his eyes again, he let his head hang forward. He breathed deeply and tried to relax. After a few moments, he looked up. His distorted reflection gazed back from the mirror, and he quickly looked away. Leaving the bathroom, Keith peeked apprehensively at the poster. Just a swirl of color, no image. Still, he felt a strange attraction to it, as if it wanted him to look into it. Uh-uh, thought Keith. No way. Keith averted his eyes, and his gaze fell on his alarm clock. Disorientation hit him, as he saw that another half hour had gone by. He was very late. Pam would be waiting and angry. If it were just her, he'd call and cancel the date. But tonight, he had the others to think about as well. Canceling now would be viewed as chickening out. Besides, his only alternative was to remain home with Mysteria. Definitely no way. Pam was waiting on her front steps when Keith pulled into her driveway. She was at the passenger door almost as soon as he stopped. He started to apologize, but she cut him off. It's okay, she told him as she got in. I was worried. I took a nap and overslept, he told her and miraculously she accepted his excuse without question. Usually she wanted full details as to why she was kept waiting. He glanced her way and she smiled at him. Then the smile changed quickly to a look of concern. Are you okay? she asked. You look kind of pale. Ah, uh, just a little headache, he told her, lying. It was actually a very big headache. 
the entire drive over, he had been trying to forget the tortured face in the poster. But his throbbing temples would not let him. I uh, took some Tylenol before I left. Should kick in pretty soon. Okay. Are you nervous? She asked. Yeah, a little, he admitted. In truth, however, he was too shaken by the image in the poster to be nervous about his official reunion with Carrie. If anything, Keith was looking forward to being in familiar surroundings with friends. You'll be fine, she told him reassuringly. it would be like old times. He returned her encouragement with a smile, but frowned inwardly. Like old times? He wondered what she meant by that. As far as he was concerned, the old times were the days when he and Carrie dated. Those old times would not be returning. The idea was to start new. Why are you frowning? Pam asked suspiciously. Apparently his inner feelings had surfaced. Uh, just the headache, he told her. He decided he was overanalyzing Pam's statement and dropped the subject with himself. I am nervous, he silently admitted. Mario and Carrie were already sitting at a table when Keith and Pam arrived at Wide Awake. The place was filled with teenagers, as were the sidewalk tables. The coffee shop was a popular teen hangout in Springwood. All the coffee shops were popular teen hangouts, though. Keith left Pam at the table while he went to the counter to order drinks. Since Mario and Carrie had already been served, he brought back a cappuccino for Pam. Because he could only carry things with one hand, he had to make a second trip for himself. He ordered a glass of steamed milk with almond flavoring. Normally, he was a coffee person like everyone else, but tonight, between the headache, the poster, and the significance of the evening, he opted for something that would relax him instead of making him hyper. On top of everything else, being with Mario reminded Keith of his nightmare. A chill ran down Keith's spine as he remembered the look of hate in Mario's eyes. At the moment, there wasn't even a hint of displeasure in Mario's expression. Seeing that made Keith feel a little better, but the image would not go completely away. Sounds like we all had pretty weird dreams last night, Pam told him as he returned with his drinks. We're going to do the dream exchange. Keith panicked. He did not want to tell this group last night's dream but for the moment he didn't know how to get out of it. The dream exchange was a ritual peculiar to Springwood. Whether it confirmed the legend of Freddy Krueger or simply perpetuated the myth as many claimed, Springwood teenagers tended to have vivid and frequently violent nightmares. The teenagers found that by talking about their dreams with friends, by exchanging them with others, the dreams became much less frightening. The first time Mario had heard of this, he thought everyone in Springwood was crazy. After experiencing several nightmares of his own, he soon realized that the dream exchange kept people from going crazy. One of the cardinal rules of the dream exchange was no lying. That violated the sanctity of a game in which trust was vital. Keith had never lied before, but he had never had a dream like this about his friends before. It doesn't have to be last night's dream, does it? He asked. Often, that was the rule, but sometimes a group would agree that any dream within a week was eligible. Why? asked Mario suspiciously. Did you have a dirty dream last night? Keith found himself blushing. The reaction was involuntary, but well-timed. No, he insisted, too strongly, hoping to convince them he had dreamed something obscene the night before. It just wasn't very interesting, but, but I had another one a couple nights ago. His plan worked. Mario smiled lasciviously. Keith could tell he would want to know the details of the supposed dirty dream when the girls weren't around. By that time, Keith would have made up a dream, and he wouldn't feel bad about lying. Okay, said Pam, as long as it was recent, but I'm going to go first. Keith was relieved. He couldn't remember any other dream at the moment. The table became silent. No one could interrupt during the dream exchange. Before Pam began, she grabbed her cup of cappuccino and clutched it like a security blanket. It was dark. I was in the woods, lost, 
and in the distance I heard howling, like wolves. The sound was... She took a deep breath, another sip, and then continued. It was scary, because I thought I could understand what the wolves or whatever were saying. Like when you can tell people are talking about you in, say, Spanish, even though you can't understand what they're saying? It was like that. They howled again. More wolves. It sounded like, and they were closer. And then I knew. They were coming for me. They seemed to be everywhere. I began to run. Leaves and branches scratched my face and caught in my hair. The howling was continuous now. I covered my ears, but it didn't help. The sounds were inside my head, but the wolves weren't. I could see their eyes glowing among the trees. I was surrounded. Suddenly, one leaped out of the darkness. Its jaws closed around my ankle and I fell. It started pulling me backward. Another bit my wrist and started pulling me in the other direction. This whipped the others into a frenzy. They poured out of the woods, biting me all over my body. It hurt so much. I tried to struggle, but it was no use. All I could see was, was fur and teeth all around me and blood, my blood. Then the wolf started to leave. Next thing I know, I'm looking up into the glowing eyes of the biggest, most ferocious wolf. It growled and opened its mouth, and its teeth were huge. Saliva dripped from them, and the drops burned the ground like acid. This one even frightened the other wolves, who backed away. Snarling, this huge wolf lunged at my throat, about to rip it out. I woke up then. Pam gulped the last of her cappuccino and placed the cup back down on the table. She was exhausted. She tried to laugh off her obvious fear. You can bet I didn't get any more sleep, and of course, every time I started to doze off, a dog barked, and I was wide awake immediately. Keith took her hand and squeezed it. The dream exchange could be rough sometimes, but invariably, telling the dream made one feel better. Pam smiled back. The others also expressed sympathy for Pam. Even Mario, who remained skeptical about the dream exchange, despite his own experiences, had been swept up in her dream. The worst thing, Pam added, was knowing the wolves were after me specifically. A slight shudder ran through her body. Mine's a little one, Keith told them. I don't know if it even qualifies as a nightmare. During Pam's story, he had remembered a strange dream from early the week before. Whatever it is, dude, said Mario, give it to us. That's what this is all about. Okay, Keith began. Like I said, it's not much, but I was walking in this empty room, and on the floor was a sewing needle. Even though the needle was tiny, and I didn't stoop down to look at it, I could see it very clearly. I could have avoided the needle easily. I, I didn't have shoes on, and the room was huge. Instead, I walked right toward it and stepped on it. I felt the needle pierce the sole of my foot, and... Keith stopped. He felt ridiculous, but the others would force him to finish anyway. I popped. <clears throat> he gulped down some steamed milk. Everyone was staring at him. He shrugged. Uh, that's it. I just popped. Maybe it was the story, maybe it was the look on his face, but Mario pounded the table and erupted in a fit of laughter. The girls joined him not long after. But Keith noticed they all sounded like themselves and the laughter was good-natured, not the evil cackle of his nightmare. You kill... <laughs> you kill me, dude, Mario gasped. You absolutely kill me, he mimicked Keith. I popped. Man, <laughs> oh man. <laughs> laughter overtook him once more. Pam, also laughing, slapped Mario on the shoulder. Stop that, you're, s you're so mean. Mario rubbed the spot she had slapped as if she had heard him, but continued to laugh. Hey, kidlets, broke in a new female voice. What's so damn entertaining? The group turned toward the voice and the sound of a chair scraping across the concrete floor. A girl with strawberry blonde hair, torn jeans, t-shirts, and a motorcycle jacket pushed in next to Carrie, setting a cup of coffee on the table. Mario immediately stopped laughing. Though no one but Keith saw it, Mario briefly glared at the girl. The look was gone in an instant, but for a moment Keith thought he had glimpsed the evil Mario of his nightmare. Hi, Sandra, said Carrie as she moved over to make room for the new girl. K 
Keith just told us a dream he had, and Mario thought it was pretty funny. Figures, uh, so what was it? Sandra asked Mario. Oh, nothing, Mario told her. His voice was flat, as if he were holding back an angry outburst. Keith will tell you. I gotta go to the bathroom. He faked a smile and left the table. What was that all about? Carrie asked after Mario had left. Sandra was the only one not surprised by Mario's behavior. Oh, don't worry about it, Sandra told them, her voice indicating that she thought it was extremely unimportant. He and Scrag got into an argument the other day. They'll get over it. Sandra's boyfriend, Richard Scrag Morton, was the leader of the school's burnout grease monkey contingent. Two years older than the others, Scrag was a third-year senior. He chain-smoked, did drugs, and was rumored to be involved in a series of recent burglaries. Why he kept returning to school when he obviously lacked interest or ability was beyond the understanding of even the guidance counselor, who repeatedly urged him to drop out. Rumor had it, he hung around to irritate the administrators and teachers who considered him one of their own failures. Others guessed he stayed in high school because it was the easiest way to meet girls. Anyone not knowing Sandra would assume from her appearance that she was made for a bottom feeder like Scrag. In fact, it was quite the opposite. Sandra was intelligent and studious at the top of the senior class academically. Scrag's dangerous image obviously excited her, and dating the smartest girl in the school was Scrag's revenge against the other students who treated him like a second-class citizen. Oddly enough, Scrag seemed to have a positive effect on Sandra. She'd absorbed a bit of Scrag's brash personality without becoming as insufferable as her boyfriend. And she had still managed to maintain her friendships with the regular kids. Unfortunately, nothing of Sandra seemed to rub off on Scrag. He was still considered a thug and a loser. So where is Mr. Wonderful tonight? Carrie asked. Keith noticed Pam was quietly staring past Sandra toward the back of the coffee shop where Mario had gone. Scrag's going to pick me up here later, Sandra replied. He had some work tonight. Car work, Keith asked, or otherwise. Everyone at the table knew what otherwise meant. He had to work on a car, Sandra told him patiently. She was used to the question. Doesn't the... Other stuff bother you? asked Pam, who had now returned her attention to the group. He's quitting his drug business, Sandra announced, as if for the first time. But they had all heard it before. Not all at once, but I've convinced him to start phasing it out. No one contradicted her. She became incredibly defensive if anyone reminded her that this was repetitious and doomed to fail. Carrie straightened in her seat, remembering something. That reminds me. I need him to take a look at my car. It's making funny noises. I'll tell him. Thanks, Carrie said. No problem. It still amazes me how he is with engines. Sandra extended her arms and spread her palms like a television evangelist. I swear the man just lays his hands on them and they are healed. They laughed, Pam a little less enthusiastically. Keith was about to ask Pam if she was all right when Sandra turned to him. So, what's this dream that's so funny? He repeated the story, but it didn't come out quite as amusing this time around. I guess you had to be there, he finished weakly. I guess so, Sandra shrugged. You want a dream? I've got one for you. She hunched forward, getting into the mood. I'm at something like a track meet, except I'm the only one running. There are people on either side of this real narrow track. Not people, really, more like an angry mob. Most have axes and knives and hammers, all sorts of weapons. At the end of the straightaway is a glowing ball. I have to get that ball. A gunshot goes off and I start running. Someone takes a swipe at me with a knife and just misses. And that's when I realize I'm not at a track meet. I'm running a gauntlet. 
Luckily, they cannot step into the track. Just reach in with their weapons. And I get hit, too, and slashed. The ones without weapons kick and punch and pull my hair. They keep knocking me down, but I get right back up and keep running. All I know is that I have to reach that ball. One time, I can hardly stand after being knocked down, so I begin to crawl. It's slower, but the mob can't reach me easily. That's when I get a look at my hands. The skin is loose and wrinkled. As I crawl forward, I realize I'm growing older, rapidly. The glowing ball is what will return me to normal, but if I crawl, it'll take me too long and I'll die of old age first. Sandra stopped and laughed, but humorlessly. I have to stand up and run. It's the only way. So that's what I do. I get up. I'm running. I get hit, stabbed, knocked to the ground, but I keep getting up. I know I'm covered with blood, but I'm getting older. Near the finish line, I fall. I put, a, put out an arm to break my fall, but as soon as my weight is on it, the arm splinters and breaks away like a dry branch. The pain should have woken me up then because I can still remember the feel of it. I struggled to my feet and stumbled forward. There were only a few steps to go, but I could barely move because my limbs, the ones I had left, were withering and losing their strength. I looked at the faces of the mob around me. Each face was different, but they were twisted with the same type of hate. And it wasn't random hate, but hatred reserved specifically especially for me. One of my legs shattered into dust and I fell. Now all I could do was drag myself forward. I only had a few feet to go, but by the way I was aging, any moment I might just crumble to nothing. Sandra looked down at her coffee. By the haunted look in her eyes, the scene was replaying itself inside her head. If there were more to the dream, her expression told them she did not want to continue. Finally, Pam broke the silence. The power of Sandra's dream had overcome whatever had been bothering her. So maybe this is a stupid question, but did you make it? Sandra looked up from the coffee and shook her head. That's the thing. Just as I would have crossed the line, the mob closed in on me and blocked the path. They cheated. I woke up as they started to tear my body apart. She paused. With the flip of her hair, she seemed to throw off the weight of the dream and smiled at them slyly. Dreams are a bitch, and then you wake up, she told them all. Then she raised her coffee cup. Here is to waking up. The others soberly raised their mugs to join in the toast that traditionally ended the dream exchange. But the sounds of a scuffle at the back of the coffee shop interrupted them. The noise quickly drew a crowd that obscured from view whatever was happening beyond the back entrance. Carrie's eyes met with Keith's. Mario never came back, she said. Instantly, all four left the table and ran toward the back entrance. Pushing through the crowd and out to the back parking lot, they discovered two figures wrestling on the asphalt. One wore a leather jacket and had dark, greasy hair. The other was Mario. Oh, shit, Keith muttered to himself. He turned to Sandra and grabbed her arm. Come on! They ran toward the fighters. Pam and Carrie followed. Before they got close, the dark-haired guy managed to roll on top, pinning Mario's arms with his legs. He began to hammer away at Mario's face. Suddenly, with a great yell, Mario threw his opponent off. Then he leaped onto his opponent and started raining blows on him. It was the same maneuver he used in wrestling, only this time Mario was out for blood, not just a pin. Mario! Keith yelled. Scrag! Sandra yelled an instant later. Neither fighter seemed to hear. Keith walked up behind Mario and hooked his arms around his friends. In the split second before he was going to pull Mario away, he saw Scrag's face. It was the face in the poster.
Okay, Slashaholics, this has been Chapter 5 of Virtual Terror in the Freddy Krueger's Tales of Terror uh, book series written by David Bergantino. Got a lot of cool character development here, but I really enjoyed the part where Keith, uh, you know, he's getting ready for the date and everything, and he starts staring at this poster and becomes obsessed with it so much that even though he'd been waiting all day and like twiddling his thumbs, getting ready for this date, was dressed an hour early, but because he got so obsessed with finding this image, he ended up being like late for this date. Very creepy and interesting how that poster just pulled him in, you know, and kept him there until he saw the face. And I have a feeling that every time he sees something in this poster, it's going to be different. You know, maybe kind of predicting what's coming or something. Uh, every time I try to guess something in this book, it throws me a curveball. So, kudos, David. Kudos to that. Uh, it's keeping me guessing, and I love that about your books here. Um, we get to see Scrag, if I'm not mistaken. We've seen him before in uh, Deadly Disguise, unless I'm getting the name wrong. Uh, somebody let me know. Am I right about that, that uh, Scrag is... Uh, one of the two bad guys in uh, Deadly Disguise. You see, Deadly Disguise takes place uh, after Virtual Terror. Uh, it's act Deadly Disguise is actually book six of six, and uh, Virtual Terror here is book three. So I kind of read them out of order. But I'm going to be doing three, four, and five in order, because uh, that's the remaining three books that David wrote. Uh, eventually, I will read books one and two by Bruce Richards, uh, but they're not connected to the story that David is telling um, in 3, 4, 5, and 6, because uh, he said he, there's little things in them that connect the to books together, uh, little character arcs and stuff. Sorry about the background noise, uh, cars driving by. Really messes up my recordings a lot. I have to stop and start a bunch. Uh, but yeah, the chapter was really long, but it was a really good chapter. Lots of character development. We got to get inside Keith's head quite a bit, uh, and we got more interaction with this poster. And then... You know, we had this whole scene with the double date, and we get to meet Sandra and Scrag. Uh, Sandra seems like a pretty interesting character, though as as much as she has everything going for her, the fact that she's dating a guy that's such a loser, she kind of loses points for me right there. Um, but that that look on Mario's face when he saw Scrag, you know, I guess that's what he saw. It just, I don't know, I, I'm curious what's going on between Scrag and Mario and what led to that fight. So I'm looking forward to getting back into this one very soon and seeing if we get some answers uh, as far as that goes. But the revelation at the end when um, Keith sees Scrag's face and realizes that's the face he saw on the poster, that's what's got me guessing, you know, is this going to be a repeating thing in the, in the narrative? Is he going to see things that kind of predict the future? That would be a cool twist. Um, and what was the, the shape thing that was in his mouth? Are we going to find that out? Um, but, you know, he's, Keith is kind of lucky because I had friends that if they're in a fight and you get up behind them and try to stop them and put your arm, you know, they turn around and swing before even thinking. So Keith's lucky he didn't get his block knocked off, uh, you, you know, trying to break up a fight between two big old guys like that. Uh, but, yeah, let me know what you guys thought of tonight's chapter, and I'll be back very soon with more Virtual Terror. Uh, we're about halfway through the book. So things should be heating up even more. And uh, I'll see you soon, guys. Until then, this has been your friendly neighborhood 80 Slasher Librarian saying thanks for listening, be excellent to each other, do good, and pleasant dreams! Also, Slashaholics, if you could do me a big favor, check out the new show I've been doing here on the channel. It's a little different than uh, the narrations and the podcast. It's a show called Slash Tracks. It's a comedy horror riff commentary show. It's kind of like Mystery Science Theater 3000 with a horror twist. Um, we have a fun little side story about how this uh, master villain named Master Evil has kidnapped me and my co-host Alex Vanover, and he forces us to watch bad horror movies. And uh, there's little opening segments with Master Evil, and then we uh, do a complete riff commentary track, uh, tearing bad horror movies and cheesy horror movies to bits uh, with a full riff commentary track that you can listen to uh, while you watch the movie yourself. Some episodes we can show the entire movie with our riff commentary playing, uh, but if we're not able to actually show the movie, uh, we, we will include a link to where you can watch the movie for free, and we'll tell you during the episode when to hit play on the movie 
so you're queued up with our uh, riff comedy uh, commentary track. And be sure to watch Slash Tracks episodes 1 through 8. They're available here on the channel now. You can find a playlist in the playlist section of the channel for Slash Tracks. And we'll be putting out new episodes every two weeks. Uh, hope you enjoy it. So uh, here's the opening intro for the show. Check it out. <laughs>